Xenoblade Chronicles is a series that seems to defy every hurdle thrown at it. From a 40-member development team on Xenoblade 2, to the seemingly impossible task of making Xenoblade 1 run on the new Nintendo 3DS, to even releasing the first game outside of Japan at all. It's as if the only hurdle this franchise can't overcome is releasing Xenoblade Chronicles X on anything other than the Wii U. And now, with Xenoblade Chronicles 3 just on the horizon, and it acting as the culmination of everything to happen in the main series, we thought it would be a good time to go back over everything that's happened thus far. Before we get started, it's important to note that as of the making of this video, Xenoblade Chronicles X is in no way connected to the events of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, 2, Torn of the Golden Country, or Future Connected. While this may change in Xenoblade Chronicles 3 or a future title, as things stand, it is entirely in its own continuity and will not be covered in this video. The same goes for the previous Monolith Soft Xeno titles, such as Xenogears and Xenosaga. There are some cameos and similar imagery shared between these various titles, but they bear little to no impact on the overall narrative. Last thing I want to mention, I'm going to be talking about a substance called Ether during this video. Ether is the Xenoblade equivalent of life energy. It's known in-universe as the building block of all life and can be harnessed for use in magic, weaponry, and more. If you have played Final Fantasy VII, think of it like the life stream and Mako. The reason I'm explaining this here and now is because a lot of things make more sense if you have this understanding in the back of your mind. Now then, with this fancy schmancy timeline made by one Tom Arnold, to help make things easier to understand, I'm going to ask you to bear with me as we cover everything that happened in Xenoblade 1, Xenoblade 2, Torn of the Golden Country, and Future Connected. Now, the place to start the overall Xenoblade timeline doesn't actually come from a video game but rather the back of a Japanese-only model kit of one of the mechs from Xenoblade 2. In the beginning of the 21st century, scientists found a very technologically advanced perpetual motion machine in Africa. This machine would later be known as the Conduit, and it became a major object of study. Ten years after its discovery, it was found that the Conduit was actually a meta-universe manifold, meaning it connects multiple universes together on top of being incredibly powerful. In response to this, the unified world government created three space stations, three space elevators, and an orbital ring around the planet, all with the express purpose of studying the conduit in a safe environment. To facilitate this, a group of AI known as the Trinity Processors was implemented to help govern the conduit. Eventually, a group of rebels known as the Savorites attacked the orbital station Radamanthus, the station that stored the conduit. Equipped with a god complex and no hope for humanity, a scientist studying the conduit named Klaus attempts to use it in an experiment to create a new universe. His fellow scientist, Galea, tries to stop him but is ignored. Klaus activates the machine and the world is destroyed. Humanity is shot into various different universes, with the only things left being the destroyed remains of society and half of Klaus, his mind and body split in two. While one half was brought into the new universe he created, the half that stayed behind is able to bear witness to not only what he created, but also what he's destroyed. Remorseful of his actions, Klaus floods the planet with a sea of clouds meant to break down the ruined world and restore it to its natural state. He then recreates life using what would later be known as core crystals, which developed into titans. Titans would then give birth to new life over the course of millennia. In order to prevent someone like him from ruining this new world, Klaus implemented the blade system meant to prevent stagnation and continue evolution. He intended to use all three of the Trinity processors, Ontos, Logos, and Numa, to manage the system, but Ontos disappeared in a space-time transition event, leaving only Logos and Numa to do it. As time passed, Klaus would watch as this new world bloomed, hoping it would avoid the faults of the one that came before. He would eventually become known to the people of this world as the Architect. Now we get to the first game in the timeline, the DLC expansion for Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Torna the Golden Country. All rest. A world made up of a sea of clouds, a giant tree branching high into the sky, and various titans. Each of the large titans are home to their own countries, races, biomes, and more. In this world, people are able to resonate with core crystals and manifest a blade, a weapon in the form of a living being. Those who resonate with the blade are known as drivers. 
When a driver dies, their blade returns to their core crystal, where they will eventually reawaken with a new driver, having no memories of their previous life. One man belonging to the Indoline Praetorium, a religious organization built around worshipping the architect, grows disillusioned with humanity and climbs the world tree. This is a Malthus. At the top of the tree, he finds nothing but two core crystals. He takes these crystals and returns to Allrest, where he bonds with one, creating the blade Malos. Amalthus and Indol see Malos as the embodiment of the architect's will, with Malos claiming the title of Aegis. However, due to Amalthus' influence, Malos begins to see the world as something that must be destroyed. In order to stop Malos' destruction, a driver who can resonate with the second Aegis core crystal is sought after, eventually leading to Prince Adam of the Kingdom of Torna. While he does bond with it, Adam is too fearful of the power of the Aegis, leading to the creation of Mithra, a weaker version of her true form. Adam and Mithra eventually team up with a mercenary named Laura and her blade Jin, as well as Emperor Hugo of the Empire of Morardain. Jin and Laura have been together since Laura was 10 years old. Jin was originally a blade of Tornin royalty, but was stolen by a man named Gort. When Laura accidentally bonds with Jin, Gort attempts to kill her before Jin steps in. Laura would later bond with another blade known as Hayes. While looking for Laura's mother on the Titan Gormot, Laura and company encounter Gort, who still wishes to reclaim Jin. They overpower Gort and Laura decides to let him live, allowing him to run off in fear and with two missing arms. The group returns to Torna where they learn of Malus's plan to attack the capital of Oresco. While they're able to stave off the attack, Malus' true goal was to release the seal on the Tornan Titan, revealing its true form and its core. The team goes to the Titan's core where they do battle with Malos, during which he attacks Oresco. This causes Mithra to go berserk, unlocking a portion of her full power, and in the ensuing battle defeats Malos, while also fatally wounding the Tornan Titan, killing a large number of its inhabitants and Emperor Hugo. Unable to handle the guilt, Mithra's personality splits, creating an even weaker version of herself known as Pyra. Adam seals away the Aegis's true sword in the Letharian Archipelago and puts Pyra herself in a stasis. She is then placed on a ship and Adam sinks it to the bottom of the Cloud Sea. Laura and Jen, meanwhile, part ways with the pair temporarily. Eventually, a horrific, grotesque beast attacks Laura and the others. This beast is Gort, having been experimented on by Indol. Laura uses Jin's sword to put him out of his misery. Back in Indol, Amalthus is appointed Praetor after orchestrating the assassination of the previous leader, and he orders an attack on Adam in an effort to destroy his Aegis. Laura is caught up in the battle and sadly dies. Jin, unable to accept that he will be reborn without his memories of Laura, eats her heart and becomes a flesh eater, a social taboo that allows him to continue living beyond his driver at the cost of his immortality. Now seeking to destroy the world and kill the architect, Jin partners himself with Malos, creating a new organization going under the name Torna. From here, we move on to Xenoblade Chronicles 2 proper. 500 years later, we open on a salvager named Rex and his Titan grandfather, Azurda. They bear witness to the death of another Titan off in the distance. In the world of all rest, land is limited and continually dwindling with every Titan that dies, leading to conflict between various countries. Currently, the Kingdom of Uriah and the Empire of Morardain are at the brink of war as a result of the dying Ardanian Titan. Rex is summoned by the corrupt chairman of the Argentum trade guild, Bana, and he is given a job offer by Jin, Malos, and a Gormati named Nia. A boat salvaged from the bottom of the Cloud Sea is raised, and they enter. Rex, being a Letharian, is required to open the door to a chamber containing Pyra. He notices a glowing green crystal and tries to touch it, but is killed by Jin for doing so. Rex finds himself in Pyra's memories of Elysium, the place at the top of the world tree, and they agree that in exchange for Pyra resurrecting Rex, he will take her there. Back in the real world, Pyra's body is removed from the ship. Malus orders Nia to kill all the witnesses, to which she protests. Pyra then awakens and Rex is resurrected. Working together, they try to fight Malos but are quickly defeated. Nia, with her blade Dromark, grab the pair and make a run for it, jumping onto Azurda's back. They crash land in Gormont, where Azurda seemingly dies. However, he instead returns to a tinier baby state and now rides around in Rex's helmet for some good old role reversal. 
They travel to the nearby town of Torgoth, where they are cornered by Ardanian soldiers and Brigid, the blade belonging to the legendary Special Inquisitor Morag. Nia and Dromark are captured, but Rex and Pyra are saved by the Napa and Tora. Tora, unable to bond with a core crystal, created an artificial blade he named Poppy. The four of them team up and go to save Nia and Dromark before they can be executed. During the escape, they are again confronted by Brigid, this time with Morag in tow, but Rex and company are able to escape. Boarding a ship headed for the World Tree, they are then stopped by a giant robotic serpent named Ophion, an artifice once wielded by Mithra that now attacks anyone who approaches the World Tree. In the ensuing chaos, they are swallowed by the Orion Titan. Inside, they meet Vandom, an Orion in charge of a mercenary guild, who teaches Rex and Pyra how to fight better as a team. They are then attacked by a member of Torna named Akos, who retreats after being bested by Vandom. Vandom offers to take the crew to the Orion capital to meet with a friend that can help them. Along the way, they meet a little turtle named Turters and are also attacked by the owner Zeke and his blade Pandoria. However, the pair is quickly defeated by their own idiocy. Once at the capital, they meet with a young girl named Iona and her caretaker Cole, a blade turned playwright. That night, Akos returns and kidnaps Iona, telling Pyra to meet him at the place where Adam first awakened the Aegis. The party fights Akos, now with Malos, and are soon overpowered due to Akos disrupting the flow of ether. Vandom impales himself with his weapon, creating a direct connection, sacrificing himself. Desperate, Pyra transforms into Mithra, who easily destroys Akos and Malos' blades, forcing them to retreat. After Vandom's funeral, Cole gives Rex his blade weapon and tells him that his driver would be able to help them. The party makes a stop in Moradain, where they meet with Mui Mui, a former lab assistant to Tor's father and grandfather. That night, someone starts attacking the town, and upon investigating, they find it is Lila, the artificial blade made by Tor's patriarchs. Lila escapes, and Morag asks the team to assist in locating her. After doing some research, it's discovered that someone has been shipping materials to an old factory on the Titan. On the way there, they are attacked by Zeke and Pandoria again. Inside the building, they find it's being used to mass-produce artificial blades, and that Tora's father is being forced to oversee it. Mui Mui then steps in to reveal he actually works for Bana, and that the artificial blades are being sold to Torna. The team is able to free Lila from their control, upgrade Poppy, and stop Bana. They are then interrupted by Mikhail and Petroka, the final two members of Torna. With the help of Morag and the surprise appearance of Hayes, they are able to stave off the attack. Hayes, now going by Fan Lenorn, tells the group that they have been summoned by Praetor Amalthus, her, Malos, and Cole's driver. They pass through the Letharian Archipelago, making a stop at Rex's hometown for the night, before meeting Zeke and Pandoria for a third time. This time, however, Morag reveals that Zeke is actually the crown prince of the Kingdom of Tantal. Zeke reveals that he's been working as a special envoy from Indol to monitor and test Rex and the Aegis. Zeke joins the crew, and they set off for the Praetorium. The day after Rex meets with Amalthus, there are reports of an attack on the Temperantian Titan by an Ardanian weapon. The party theorizes this is Torna's attempt to force a war between Moradain and Oriya to break out, so they go to put a stop to it. There, Jin kills Fan Lenorn, and as the Orion army arrives, the Praetorium steps in to prevent further conflict. A meeting of the nations is held, with the Orion Queen and Emperor Nile, Morag's brother, attending. Fan Lenorn is given a state funeral. There, Mithra notes that Fan did not revert to her core crystal, and that her crystal was not the same shape as it was 500 years ago. Amalthus tasks Rex and company with traveling to the Kingdom of Tantal to retrieve the Omega Fetter, the one object that can control Ophion. Before they can leave, however, word gets out about an assassination plot led by Bana, hoping to profit off war. Despite being defeated, an explosive Bana place goes off and fatally injures Nile. In secret, Nia steps in to revive him, revealing a core crystal. Once they arrive in Tantal, Morag grows suspicious. Zeke's father, King Eulogimenos, imprisons the gang and seizes Pyra, hoping to kill her to make the world safer. However, due to Morag's planning, the team escapes, saves Pyra, and through diplomacy assuages tensions. Due to the Aether Accelerator meant to kill Pyra being pushed in a different direction, the blast hits the Omega Fetter and sends the Tantalese Titan into a nosedive. The party attempts to repair it, but are ambushed by Torna. Jin reveals his true form, allowing him to bypass Mithra's foresight and even destroy her sword. Before Jin can kill Rex, Pyra threatens to vaporize herself with Siren, an artifice that fires a high-powered laser from space. In exchange for not killing herself and for going with Torna, Jin lets the rest of the party go free. King Eulogimenos tells the group of another Aegis sword sealed away in the Letharian Archipelago, and the group ventures back to Rex's hometown. There, they unlock the Spirit Crucible Elpis. 
Traveling inside, it's revealed that Zeke has part of Pandora's core crystal embedded into him, making him what he calls a Blade Eater. This comes as a result of a strange experiment Amalthus performed on the pair. This revelation is soon followed up with another one, as Nia reveals herself as a Flesh Eater, one who had previously been the victim of abuse and became ashamed of who she was. But through Rex's encouragement, she begins to accept herself for who she is. Upon defeating the challenge Adam had placed to test Rex, he receives the third Aegis Sword, and the party sets out for the Cliffs of Moritha, the titan closest to the World Tree. There, the party battles Malos, who, after using Pyra to repair his core crystal, wields a weapon that lets him use attacks with names that all start with Monado. Malos is temporarily defeated by Nia, before later regrouping with Jin. During the fight with Jin, Rex is able to manifest the third Aegis Sword, reviving Pyra and transforming her into her true form. She summons Siren to fight the now Malos controlled Ophion, and the collateral damage leads to everyone falling into the void below. Rex wakes up in the land of Moritha, the ruins of a lost civilization located at the bottom of the Cloud Sea, where he meets up with half the party. They also run into Jin as he defends himself from a deformed monstrosity called a Goldo. Making a temporary truce, they fight their way towards the World Tree, with Goldos dropping everyday items like ID cards. Rex eventually reunites with the rest of his party, while Jin is eventually saved by Torna arriving in their ship. Torna makes their way towards Elysium, with Rex and company giving chase. Upon entering the World Tree, however, they find it to be a lot more technological than they expected. Torna discovers that the Indoline Titan has made its way to the tree, taking aim at their ship. After dropping Jin and Malice off near the top, Akos, Petroka, and Mikhail stay behind to battle Indol, making use of their artificial blades. Amalthus contacts Rex, ordering him to cease their climb, but is promptly rejected. He then reveals he is actually a Blade Eater, having transplanted Fan Lenorn's core crystal onto his body. Using a combination of her powers and his status as the driver of the Aegis, he starts summoning various titans to join in the fight. Mikhail orders Akos and Petroka to leave. He transforms the ship into its combat form and continues to fight before ultimately losing his life. Rex and crew slowly work their way up the tree, partaking in the battle against Amalthus when they can, before catching up with Jin. Having told Malos to go on ahead, Jin transforms into his true form and clashes with Rex. During this, Akos and Petroka arrive. Amalthus, having transformed into a monster after merging with hundreds of core crystals, kills Petroka and Akos. With the party's help, Jin is able to deal the final blow to Amalthus. However, Jin too collapses and dies, leaving Rex and company to chase after Malos. They arrive in Elysium, only to find it completely desolate and lifeless. As they explore the ruins further, Rex is separated from the rest of the party, receiving disturbing visions of his friends and family. These visions cease, being the work of the Architect. He tells the party of his old universe and how this world came to be, that Malos and Pyramithra's true names are Logos and Numa respectively, that the half of himself that was blown into this new universe is on the verge of death and that he will follow, with the conduit vanishing from the universe. Malos activates Ion, an uber-powerful artifice, and begins his assault on the Earth, with the main party rushing to stop him. Rex triumphs over Malos right as the conduit disappears, causing Elysium to fall apart. Numa chooses to stay behind and use the remains of Ion to destroy the World Tree, and prevent it from destroying all rest as it falls. Rex protests, but is given the remaining parts of Numa's core crystal allowing him to live independently of her, and forcing him to leave her behind. As the escape pod is torn apart upon re-entry, Azurda returns to his titan form and catches the party. However, looking upon all rest, they find that there are no titans left. As the Cloud Sea dissipates, a vast ocean and a green continent appear, with the various titans merging into it. As they look towards the new world, Numa's core crystal starts to glow, restoring both Pyra and Mithra, and separating them into bodies of their own. Nia pushes Rex towards the pair, and the game ends. Whew, okay, that was a lot. And guess what? We're only halfway done! For this next part, we're actually going to double back to Klaus's experiment. While the architect was capable of seeing both destruction and creation, the half of himself blown into this new world only saw the latter. A world with nothing more than a boundless sea. Having been brought into this world as gods, Klaus and Galea created the Bionis and the Mechanis, respectively. Galea, having been reborn as a mechanical being, created life known as the Machina, which resided on the Mechanis. Klaus, remaining organic, created various creatures on the Bionis, such as giants, Napons, and the human-like Homs. However, these beings also existed as food for Klaus and the Bionis, 
as when they died, their ether would return to the Titan. To help facilitate this, Klaus created the Telethia, which existed to destroy life on the Bionis. Some of these creatures were then turned into Hyentia, a humanoid form which could return to Telethia upon being exposed to high amounts of ether. Eventually, the two gods gained new names. Galea became Maneth, while Klaus became Zanza. As time passed, Zanza feared both his potential death and the loneliness of being forgotten. To prevent this, he used his weapon, the Monado, to possess a giant named Arglas, create an alliance with a giant named Dixon, a Hyentia named Lorthea, and a Homs named Alvis, and then began an assault on the Mechanis. Maneth fought back, and in the process, both Titans died at the same time, freezing them in place and greatly weakening both gods. Zanza allowed himself to be captured by the Hyentia. His body, still possessing Arglas, was stored on Prison Island, while his soul remained in the Monado and sealed away in Valak Mountain. Maynith, in preparation for Zanza's return, entered a deep slumber within the Machanis. One Machina, named Egil, seeking revenge for his people and to prevent Zanza from rising again, created an army of mindless machines called Mechon. Hoping to wipe out Zanza's food source, Egil waged war with the people of Bionis. Meanwhile, the rest of the Machina retreated to the severed arm of the Machanis seeking peace. Thousands of years later, a group of Homs come across the Monado. Absorbing their ether, Zanza kills the group and possesses a young boy named Shulk. Shulk is then rescued by Dixon, now in the disguise of a Homs, and brought back to Colony 9 alongside the Monado. We skip ahead another couple of years, and we open on an army of Homs fighting an army of Mechon. A Homs named Dunban wields the Monado at great cost to his body, but seeing as the Monado is the only edge the Homs have, he accepts the risk. Alongside his war buddies Dixon and Mumkar, they continue to fight, only for Mumkar to get cornered by the Mechon after a failed attempt at taking the Monado for himself. A year passes by. Shulk spends his time studying the Monado and hanging out with his friends Rhine and Fiora, Dunban's sister. This piece is interrupted by a surprise attack by the Mechon. Dunban, still recovering from the battle a year prior, is unable to fight with the Monado, leading to Shulk picking it up. He finds that not only can he wield it, but he also starts to receive visions of the near and far future. He also finds that these visions are not set in stone, giving him the chance to change the future. Despite this, Fiora dies in a battle against a new faced Mechon the Monado is unable to damage. Dubbing Fiora's murderer Metal Face in English and a less than okay name in Japanese, Shulk and Ryan then set out to avenge Fiora and Colony 9, with Dunban promising to follow behind once he's recovered. As they travel through Tefra Cave, Shulk is visited by Alvis in a dream. He tells him that while the Monado can help him change the future, finding the true Monado will allow him to do anything with it. Making it to the Bionis leg, the pair save a boy named Juju and bring him back to his camp. This camp is made up of the remaining people of Colony 6 after it had been taken by the Mechon. After getting into a fight with his sister Sharla, Juju is captured by a new faced Mechon calling himself Zord. Sharla joins up with Shulk and Ryan, and the trio head towards the Aether Mines underneath Colony 6. There, they meet a Thoron, a resident of Colony 6, who stayed behind with Charlotte's fiancé, Gatto, to fend off the attack. The group is able to rescue Juju, and in the process, defeat Zord. Leaving the mines, however, they find themselves surrounded by several faced Mechons identical to Zord, as well as Metal Face. It's then that Dixon and Dunban join in the fight. Eventually, a Telethia attacks the Mechon. As Shulk fights Metal Face, he receives a vision. A jailed giant welcomes Shulk as the true heir of the Monado. Shulk's victory over Metal Face. And a different face Mechon having its torso torn apart, revealing something inside. The Mechon retreats, and the Telethia flies off, landing next to Alvis on a hill far away. Shulk tells the group of his new vision, and Dixon surmises it takes place on Prison Island, located on the head of the Bionis, giving the team a new destination. After Dixon leaves, the group travels through the Satoral Marsh and ends up in Magna Forest, where they find a High Entia girl on the verge of death. In order to save her, Shulk goes looking for water ether crystals. While looking by a waterfall, Shulk meets Alvis before being attacked by Telethia. Shulk is unable to defeat them, leading to Alvis grabbing the Monado and unlocking a new ability. Using this power, they're able to beat the Telethia back, but before Shulk can ask how Alvis did this, he vanishes. Once saved, the High Antia girl introduces herself as Melia, who repays the group by leading them to Earth Sea at the head of the Bionis. Taking them to the Frontier Village, the home of the Nopon, they are given access to their next destination. 
However, Melia chooses to stay behind, seeking to complete her original mission of defeating a Telethia that ended in failure. Shulk and company insist on helping her, with the Napon village volunteering the aid of Riki, this year's hero pawn due to his excessive amount of debt. The party defeats the Telethia and they move on to Aerith Sea. Once there, they venture to the High Antia capital of Alchemoth, where it's revealed that Melia is actually the daughter of Emperor Sorian. It's also revealed that she is half Homs, leading to her facing prejudice from some pure-blooded Hyantia like her stepmother Eumea and the royal advisor Lorathea. Unbeknownst to Melia, Shulk and the others have been arrested, as it is prophesied that the true heir to the Monado will one day use it to destroy the Hyantia. While in prison, they are visited by the Hyantia's divine seer, Alvis, who frees them. The group soon learns that Melia is about to partake in her inauguration ceremony that will solidify her as the next emperor upon her father's death. To do so, she must partake in an ancient ritual that requires her to travel through the ancient Hyantia tomb. Yumea orders her servant Tyrea to assassinate Melia during the ceremony. Learning of this conspiracy through a vision, Shulk and company gain permission to enter the tomb and put a stop to it. While they're able to stop the assassination, Tyrea escapes. Soon after, the Mechons stage an attack on Alchemoth, with Sorian traveling to Prison Island so that he may protect his people. The party, having received a vision of Sorian's death, chase after him. There, they meet Zanza, who offers to release the Monado's true power, in which Shulk accepts. It's then Metalface throws a spear at Zanza, killing him, but not before unshackling the Monado and allowing it to harm Metalface. In the chaos of battle, Metalface kills Sorian and is defeated by Shulk, before dealing the finishing blow, another faced mechon named Face Nemesis takes the hit, revealing a mechanized Fiora inside. Face Nemesis and Metal Face escape. Shulk, confused over what just transpired, seeks answers. Melia leaves her brother Kallion in charge, who states his intentions of creating a unified force made up of all the races of Bionis. The party heads towards Galahad Fortress in Sword Valley, with Alvis acting as their guide through Valak Mountain. While there, they are approached by Face Nemesis, who seeks answers of her own. Her reactions indicate that she is not the Fiora Shulk once knew, but rather someone else inhabiting her body. Metal Face, having grown suspicious of Face Nemesis, attacks, revealing himself to be Mumkar. Dunban is able to overpower him, but the fight is interrupted by mass-produced faces and a golden mechon introducing himself as Ego. Leaving with the Face Nemesis, Shulk and company are left with even more questions. After meeting up with Dixon and leaving him with Alvis at the entrance of Sword Valley, the team makes their way to Galahad Fortress, only to be greeted by Mumkar. During the encounter, Shulk stops Dunban from killing Mumkar, stating he now wants to put a stop to the war and bloodshed between the Bionis and Makanis. He then receives a vision of Mumkar's death and tries to prevent it, but Mumkar's pride ultimately leads to his own demise. Inside Galahad Fortress, they're ambushed by the face Nemesis, who is now being controlled by Ego. He activates a machine called the Apocrypha Generator that deactivates the Monado, rendering it useless. Fiora reaches out to the spirit inhabiting her body, allowing the spirit to break free and fight Ego, leading to the destruction of the fortress and everyone falling to the depths below. Shulk wakes up on the beach of the Fallen Arm next to the remains of the face Nemesis. He pulls Fiora's body from the wreckage and revives it, with Fiora finally in control of her body once again. They reunite with the others in the hidden Machina village. The party is told of a path towards the Makanis and to seek help from Egil's sister, Venea. While traveling through Makanis Field, the gang is ambushed by a new-faced Mechon named Jadeface, who is actually Charlotte's fiance, Gatto. Surviving the encounter, they are greeted by Venea, who explains that the spirit previously controlling Fiora was actually Maynith, having been put there by her to get Maynith in close proximity to Shulk and the Monado. Traveling through the Makanis Central Factory, the party arrives in the Makanis capital of Agniritha, where they aim to confront Egil. Gatto gets the jump on the party and is promptly defeated, with Egil's control over him broken. After being wounded by Shulk in battle, Egil retreats to the Makanis core, reviving the Makanis and beginning an assault on the Bionis. Gatto sacrifices his life to protect the group, who are then saved by the Machina. Entering through the vents on the Makanis' back, the party destroys the Apocrypha generator and Shulk defeats Egil before he can destroy the Bionis. Given the upper hand, Shulk is almost driven to kill Egil by the voice of Zanza, but is stopped by Fiora and Venea. He instead extends a hand to Egil, only to be shot in the back by Dixon, releasing Zanza. 
Maynath takes control of Fiora's body and battles him before sacrificing herself. Zanza takes Maynath's Monado and teleports to Prison Island. The island enters into the Bionis' head, reviving the Titan. Eggle fights back with the Mechanis, but to no avail. Both Eggle and the Mechanis cease to exist. The Mechanis save the party once again and regroup with the allied forces. Dixon attacks with Telethia and Kallian fights back. However, Lorethea releases a high concentration of ether, forcing all pure-blooded Hyantia to transform into Telethia. The party retreats to Colony 6, where they fight off an invasion. Inside Shulk's mind, he is visited by Alvis, telling him that only he may decide his future. Shulk resolves to defeat Zanza and is revived, joining the fight with a replica Monado that the Machina created. Dixon calls for Alvis to join him. The latter abides and the pair leave. Shulk and company leave Colony 6 and head for Prison Island, traveling through the Bionis interior and defeating Lorethea. Once on Prison Island, they fight Dixon, who has revealed his true form as a giant. Dixon eventually forfeits the fight, claiming he doesn't care anymore. As the group walks through a portal, Dixon dies. Floating in space, Zanza attempts to see into the future, but is unable to see anything further than his coming fight with Shulk. During the final battle, Shulk manifests his own Monado, making him a god. Zanza curses Alvis for betraying him, to which Alvis responds, I am Monado. I was here at the beginning, and I will proclaim the end. Shulk cuts through Zanza's body, killing him. After the battle, Alvis appears to Shulk formless, showing him Zanza's history as Klaus. Shulk asks Alvis what he is, to which he says, I am the administrative computer of a phase transition experiment. Alvis tells Shulk that the world is dying, and that it is up to him what will happen from here. Shulk decides that he wants to create a new world, one with no need for gods. Six months later, everyone is shown to have survived and made the transfer to this new world. All the various races of the Bionis and Mechanis live in harmony. Fiora goes to see Shulk, revealing that she has returned to her original Hom state. The camera pans out to reveal the world is now built on the collapsed remains of the Bionis, and the game ends. Oh, also, Melia and Tyrea are sisters. You only learned that in a side quest, and I couldn't figure out a good way to work that information in, so here you go. Next up is Future Connected, the epilogue game that was included in the definitive edition of Xenoblade Chronicles that was made with the express purpose of not only capping off the story of the first game, but also to lay the groundwork for future titles. One year after the events of the base game, the Bionis shoulder continues to float in the sky. After Melia and Shulk learn that Alchemoth has been sighted on it, they fly up to investigate. As they approach, a laser is shot out of Alchemoth, shooting their ship down. Near the crash site, they find two of Riki's children, Kino and Nene, who snuck aboard the ship wanting to help. They learn of the people who have been surviving on the shoulder in the town of Grandel. While Grandel is made up of Machina, Homs, Hyantia, and Nopon, some Hyantia, calling themselves the Companions, have made their own camp elsewhere, refusing to live with the Machina after what Egil did. The Companions have made repeated attempts to reclaim Alchemoth, but were defeated every time by a creature they call the Fog King. Traveling to Alchemoth on foot, they notice a rift in the sky and they rescue a young Hyantia named Teelin from a Fog Beast, a creature that has been infected by the Fog King. Upon encountering the Fog King, the team learns that they are unable to hurt it and retreat. Going to Teelin's lab, they learn that he is trying to find a way to revert the Telethia and Alchemoth to their Hyantia forms, and that Tyrea has been acting as his guardian. One Hyantia named Galgar, believing that pure-blooded Hyantia should not be restored, learns of these plans and attempts to kill Teelin. However, the party is able to fight him off, and he later throws himself off a cliff in a side quest and is presumed dead. Working with Teelin and Tyrea, the party protects Grandel from the Fog Beast while looking for a way to harm the Fog King. Meanwhile, the rift continues to grow bigger and bigger, with more wildlife becoming infected by the fog. Shulk eventually conceives of a way to create a special ether field that would allow him to harm the Fog King using his new Monado replica EX. However, they also realize they are unable to protect the village and confront the Fog King at the same time. Melia suggests convincing the companions to defend Grandel while they're gone. Successful in this endeavor, they head to Alchemoth. The party engages the Fog King, creating that special ether field and allowing them to deal damage to it. Despite this, they still struggle to combat the beast. As this happens, Telethia starts flying into the rifts, destabilizing it and weakening the Fog King. Melia unleashes one final attack, vaporizing the Fog King, and the rift vanishes. Sometime later, Alchemoth has been restored, with people gathering for the proper coronation of Melia, 
finally making her the official empress of the Hyentia. Melia confides in Tyrea, to which Tyrea comforts her, pledging her support towards her sister and the new empress. The last thing you need to know is that at some point, whether before or after Future Connected, the worlds of Xenoblade 1 and 2 combine into the same universe, setting the stage for the war between Kevis and Agnes. Once again, that was a lot. That basically covers everything you need to know, whether you're starting out with Xenoblade Chronicles 3, or just need a refresher of all the events so far. As you can see, these games go the extra mile in terms of building their worlds and characters, and I fully expect Xenoblade 3 to go even further in terms of tying these worlds together. So what will happen in this new world of Ionios? Well, you'll just have to find out when Xenoblade Chronicles 3 launches July 29th on the Nintendo Switch.